We've now seen how we can write expressions in OCaml, each of which has a value that can be computed. Often, it will be helpful to give names to those values to be referenced later in some other expression. In OCaml, to give a name to a value to be used in some other expression, we can use a let expression. A let expression takes the following form. Let var colon type equal expert def in expert body. Here, var is the new variable we're introducing, which will be a name for a value of the given type. Expert def is an expression that defines the value that the variable will name. And then expert body is an expression where we can use the new variable name we've defined. To take a simple example, we could have an expression like let x colon int equal 3 in x times x. Here, we're defining a new variable named x whose type is int. x will have a value of 3, so we say that this let construction binds the name x to the value 3 for use in the expression x times x. The x times x is the body of the let expression, and it can make reference to the name x. The value of this whole expression is whatever the body of the expression would evaluate to if all x's were first replaced by the value 3. So in this case, OCaml would evaluate 3 times 3, and this whole expression would evaluate to 9. Since OCaml is implicitly typed, we usually don't need to include the type of the variable in the let expression. We could instead have said just let x equal 3 in x times x, and OCaml would be able to infer that x is an int. Still, it's sometimes useful to have the explicit typing to make our intentions clear, even in cases where OCaml could have inferred the type of the variable on its own. One important thing to recognize is that these let expressions are just OCaml expressions like any other, so they have values that can be used inside larger expressions. In the same way that 9 plus 2 is a valid expression, and 3 times 3 plus 2 is a valid expression, let x equal 3 in x times x plus 2 is also a valid OCaml expression that evaluates to 11. We can even embed let expressions inside of other let expressions. For example, imagine that we wanted to write an expression to compute the area of a circle of radius 2. The area of a circle is computed as pi times the radius squared, so we could write 3.14 times 2 times 2. But if we wanted to make clear that 2 is a radius here, it might be helpful to give that value a name. So we could equivalently write let radius equal 2 in 3.14 times radius times radius for an expression that has the same value but is a little easier to read. And then, to make clear that we're using the value of pi here, we might give a name to 3.14 as well and write let pi equal 3.14 in let radius equal 2 in pi times radius times radius. The parentheses in this case are optional, so we could write the same expression without the parentheses as well. When we use a let expression of this form, letting a variable name equal a value in a body expression, that variable name is only available in the body expression. That body expression is what we call the scope of the variable, the code where that variable name is available to be used. If we try to use a variable outside of its scope, we'll get an error. For example, in this expression, we're using the value x outside of the body of the let expression that binds it, so we get an unbound value error. We're not allowed to use x here. We're also not allowed to use a variable in its own definition in a let expression. Let x equal x plus 1 in x times x would also produce an error because of the use of the name x in the definition x plus 1. And for good reason too, since it's not clear what value x should take on in a recursive definition like this. If two expressions have separate scopes, they might have the same name refer to different values. For example, consider the expression let x equal 2 in x times x, plus let x equal 3 in x times x. Here, the first let binding of x to 2 applies to the first x times x, giving the left side of this expression a value of 4. 
Meanwhile, the second let binding of x to 3 applies to the second x times x, giving the right side of the expression a value of 9. What happens, though, when a name is defined twice in the same scope? OCaml does allow this sort of expression. For example, we might have let x equal 2 in let x equal 3 in x times x. Here, what will x refer to in the innermost expression x times x? OCaml's rule, which is consistent with most other modern programming languages, is to choose the nearest enclosing binding construct for the variable. In this case, the nearest binding of x that encloses the expression x times x is the binding of x to 3. As a result, this expression evaluates to 9. The outermost x, which is bound to 2, we say has been shadowed by the innermost x. Let's take a trickier example. Consider the expression let x equal 1 in x plus let x equal 2 in x plus let x equal 4 in x. Here, what does each x refer to? Well, in each case, we look to the nearest binding construct that encloses the variable. So for this first x, it's bound by the binding of x to 1, the only binding of x that encloses it. For this second x, it's bound by the binding of x to 2, since that's now the closest binding of x that encloses it. And for the same reason, this third x is bound by the binding of x to 4. As a result, this expression will be evaluated as 1 plus 2 plus 4, giving us a value of 7. When we're shadowing variables like this, we can also make reference to previous bindings of the variable's name. For example, we noted before that an expression like let x equals x plus 1 generally isn't valid. But if x had already been bound outside of this let expression, then the expression might be okay. Take the expression let x equals 3 in let x equal x plus 1 in x times x. Here we have let x equal x plus 1 again, but this time the x is bound by the previous binding to 3. So x is now bound to the value of 3 plus 1, or 4, and then in the expression x times x, the nearest binding of x is the binding to 4, which gives the whole expression a value of 16. It can take some practice, getting used to variable names and let binding, but the key to remember is that a variable name will always be bound by its nearest enclosing binding construct. So far, all of these let expressions have introduced local variables that are only valid in the scope of the body of the let expression. Sometimes, though, we'll want to introduce a global name that's valid anywhere in the remainder of the file or the remainder of our REPL session. For that, we can leave off the in expert body part of the let expression to define a name that can be used globally. Note that this is only possible in the top level of the file or REPL session. That is to say, we can't define a global name from inside of another expression. In our REPL session, for example, if we write let x equal 8, then for the remainder of the REPL session, we can use the variable name in other expressions, and they'll use this binding of x to 8, unless it gets shadowed by some later binding to the variable x. While naming values like integers and floating point numbers can be helpful for readability, where names become especially useful is when we're giving names to functions. We'll take a look at that in the next chapter.